Well, let's open in prayer this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us your magnificent, precious word through which you have made those who are in Christ alive together with your Son. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for using it to transform us and that it continues to transform us into the image of your Son. Lord, we pray that you would use your word tonight, that your Son would be glorified, that we would be convicted, and we would be spurred to greater faithfulness to our Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, it was just a great day today um, at Grace Bible Church, just getting to see and hear the testimony of lives that have been transformed by the gospel and seeing us welcome new members into the church. Just what a privilege. And uh, I know some of you made it back uh, tonight, so just pleased to see you tonight. As we discussed, we've been in our 66 book series, uh, taking a little bit of a break from our verse by verse exposition of scripture that we normally do on Sunday mornings to do uh, one of the sort of those 30,000 foot views of each book of the Bible. And tonight we are looking at the book of 1 Peter. So let me ask you, are you afraid of something? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the dark? Maybe you're afraid of getting stuck in an elevator or being trapped underwater. If you've been bit before, you might be afraid of dogs or feral cats or bees. Maybe you're afraid of cancer or a packed Supreme Court or the government taking your guns or trampling your American rights, which were never promised to you by God in this life anyway. Or maybe you're afraid of what it might mean to suffer for Christ. Sure, there's persecution in the world, but will I be called to suffer? To suffer for Christ? Are you afraid of being hated because of your faith, of having your reputation destroyed because of upholding God's word? Maybe losing out on a promotion because you're a Christian or oppose a view of gender or marriage that rejects God's word. Maybe you'll lose your job. Have you ever thought, how am I going to handle that kind of opposition to the gospel, that kind of persecution when it comes? Will I cower in fear and abandon my Savior? Maybe you've read stories of the martyrs and you say, I don't know, that's that's not me. I mean, how can I hope to hold on to my faith under that kind of pressure? I mean, I want to believe that I'd honor the Lord, but I'm really not sure how I'd respond when I'm hated and reviled and slandered as a Christian or mistreated or imprisoned. Will I still be faithful when my life is threatened? Will I stand firm when it will cost me my life, when I might be able to make it stop with just a word? Well, if that's you, and that's really all of us, then 1 Peter is for you. Tonight we will do an overview of 1 Peter, and you can read this book on your own in about 15 minutes, but together we'll look tonight at just some key passages and then make some initial observations about Peter's reason for writing. And then we'll trace some of those major themes across the book, uh, which are great themes for you to pay attention to as you read this book on your own, perhaps this next week. So as we spend some time looking at 1 Peter, um, you can open to chapter 1, and we'll hit a few key sections. Pay special attention to the theme of suffering as Peter writes. We will begin in verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, 
turn down to chapter 2, verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19. For this finds favor, this finds grace, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unrighteously. For what credit is there if when you sin and are treated harshly, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this finds favor with God. Turn to chapter 3 verse 13, chapter 3, verse 13. And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their fear and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and fear, having a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you should suffer for doing good, rather than for doing wrong. Flip over to chapter 4, beginning of chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to no longer live the rest of the time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but to live the rest of the time living for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient to have worked out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, maligning you. Maligning you because you don't participate. You won't go where they go. You live differently. Skip ahead to verse 12 of chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree... You are sharing the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be put to shame, but is to glorify God in this name. What is 1 Peter all about? Clearly, this is the book about suffering. Peter does open the book also talking about various kinds of suffering. So there is a broad applicability to the type of suffering that you are going through in this world, any type of suffering. And so the truths of 1 Peter apply to the suffering that you experience. But Peter focuses his attention on a particular type of suffering for most of his letter. Suffering at the treatment of government officials, masters and employers, neighbors, even husbands and wives. That is, suffering at the hands of others, and especially suffering at the hands of unbelievers. Many of his readers were suffering for their faith their allegiance to Christ, their faithfulness to the Lord, their refusal to cave under the pressures of this world. They lived differently, and they suffered for it. Look back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, not being conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your conduct. Because God is holy, believers, as His children, so are we to be holy. And as verse 17 shows, we are to conduct ourselves in the fear of God. And, and this type of separate, distinct living will always stand in sharp contrast to the world. And Peter's readers had learned that this type of living would bring opposition. So Peter addresses that type of opposition. 
So as we talk about 1 Peter tonight, if we were to take a conventional approach, maybe to walking through the book, a conventional approach to 1 Peter might go something like this. We might look at the topics of salvation, submission, and suffering. Um, there's some verse divisions up there. And, and that approach is helpful, and it would be helpful. But these, even these three themes don't stay nicely contained, and they actually resist being pressed into a neat outline like this. Salvation truths bleed into every chapter of this book, as does suffering. And while the middle section of the book does have a particular emphasis upon submitting under earthly authorities, the topic of submission will come up again in chapter 5 in the context of the church. And really, this whole book is a plea for steadfast submission to God's sovereignty and trusting ourselves to Him amidst suffering. So as we consider how to think through this book, I'd like to look at how a few of the repeated themes can be traced throughout this book and how those fit with Peter's stated purposes for writing the book. So we'll sort of abandon this outline for the evening. So turn now to 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. And we read, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and bearing witness that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. At the time of Peter's writing in the early 60s, persecution was probably not yet the official policy of the Roman Empire, um, but it was a time of increasing hostility and persecution. But in just a short time, likely not more than a year or two, the policy of the Roman Empire under Nero would change and Christian suffering would exponentially increase. We've heard the accounts of Emperor Nero burning Christians as living torches for his garden parties. But that was still future, if just by a little. And so in many ways, then, the experience of Peter's readers is not far from, in many senses, to the experience of us today. We live in a time of increasing opposition in the workplace, in the public square, and at local government levels, legal or not. And we know from God's word that our present experience of suffering will only increase as we get closer to the return of Christ. So would Peter's readers persevere in their present suffering? Were they ready for the additional suffering to come? Are we ready? Amidst their suffering, in verse 12, Peter calls them to stand firm Verse 12, having written to you briefly, exhorting and bearing witness that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. So verse 12 of chapter 5 really provides a sort of summary for the book. And that's really the purpose of this book. The purpose is up on the screen for you. Peter testifies to and pleads with believers to stand firm in the grace of God while suffering for Christ. Peter writes that they would stand firm in grace and endure suffering to the end. And so, before we jump into the book in more detail, I think it would be helpful for us just to think about who is Peter? Well, in the letter, Peter describes himself in two different ways. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, he describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. In chapter 5, he describes himself as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. So we take from that, Peter saw Christ suffer. It qualifies him to write a little bit on suffering. But we know, and no doubt Peter's readers would have known, quite a bit more about Peter. And as they receive this letter from him, addressing their suffering and his plea for them to stand firm, Peter's own experiences would have no doubt been on their minds. So I just want to recall Peter's denial of Christ. We're, we're familiar with that. I found in Mark 14, you don't need to turn there, um, but Mark 14, Jesus told the 11 disciples, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall all be scattered. But what did Peter say? If you remember Peter's response in verse 29 of Mark 14, well, even though all fall away, yet I will not. But of course, Jesus tells him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times tonight. Well, remember Peter's response to Jesus 
If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. I love Peter. Uh, but we know what happens next. Peter says, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. I'm not one of them. I don't know the man you're talking about. And then Peter throws himself down and begins to weep. His denial of his Savior. Peter knows what it means to cave under pressure. He knows what it means to deny Christ under the potential threat of his own harm. He knows what it means to be afraid of man and what they can do to you. But Jesus had plans for Peter. And as we look at most of the post-resurrection appearances of Christ, Peter is called out specifically by name, even when the other apostles are not. There just seems to be this special attention to make it clear that Jesus, Jesus appeared, and that included Peter. Which may have appeared shocking to the first readers. Peter, the one who denied Christ, Jesus appeared to him. If you recall 1 Corinthians 15, Christ actually appeared to Peter first and then the rest of the apostles. Well, in John 21, and if you can just turn to John 21, this is worth looking at briefly. In John 21, we actually find the account of Jesus gently restoring Peter and commissioning him for future service. Um, in verses 15 through 17, we, the familiar story, Peter, if you love me, tend my lambs. Peter, if you love me, shepherd my sheep. If you love me, tend my sheep. And Jesus commissions this fearful, faithless deserter into his service as a shepherd. But it's easy to forget the end of Peter's restoration account. Look at verse 18. After telling him to tend my sheep in verse 17, Jesus says to him in verse 18, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. What was Jesus saying? Peter, because of your love for me, you're going to shepherd my sheep, and one day for God's glory, you're going to stretch out your hands and you're going to die like me. And then notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 19. He says, we read, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Before his death, Jesus had said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, rather than denying himself and following Christ, Peter had denied Christ and fled. But now Jesus repeats this command to Peter, Peter, follow me. And Peter knew at this point exactly what the cost of following Christ would be for him. But when his own life came on the line again, would Peter still give in to fear? Would Peter cave under the pressures of the world, or would Peter stand firm in the grace of the Lord? Well, how did Peter fare? In Acts 4, Peter's arrested and threatened. He refuses to remain silent about Christ. In Acts 5, Peter, along with the apostles, is jailed again, and they're again commanded to stop preaching Christ. And in verse 29 of Acts 5, we read, But Peter and the apostles answered, Notice Peter, Peter is the spokesman for the apostles here, and said, we must obey God rather than men. And verse 40 tells us what happened to them. And after calling the apostles in and beating them, they commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. Well, what effect did this arrest and beating have on Peter? Would Peter shrink in fear? Would he stop speaking the name of Christ as he once had? We'll look at verse 41. So they went on their way from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. And every day in the temple from house to house, they did not cease teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Peter had been transformed into a bold proclaimer of the gospel who gladly embraced suffering for the name of Christ. The man who was once afraid to confess Christ before a servant girl now willingly denied himself, followed Christ, endured scorn, imprisonment, and beatings. And he knew that one day he would follow Christ and suffer to the point of death. And church history confirms that Peter, like Christ, would likely die by crucifixion. 
So what equipped Peter to endure such suffering? What gave him such boldness? What truths anchored him when he suffered unjustly? Well, as he writes to these believers, enduring suffering, this is what 1 Peter is all about. And it is these truths that just like Peter would equip suffering believers to stand firm in the grace of God. So tonight, what I'd like to just do is look at six grace realities that you must embrace to stand firm in suffering. Uh, well, we're going to be jumping back and forth throughout the book. Again, 1 Peter just sort of resists a nice packaged outline. So we'll look at some of these themes, and I just encourage you in your own time, take, as you read this book, look for these themes and several other themes that we won't even get to talk about tonight. But the first is that Christ has met your greatest need, and therefore you are to rejoice in the finished work of Christ. Now, I've got the verses here on the page in front of you. Um, you can also go onto our website, um, go to the series, all 66 books, and you can download the outline so you don't have to write down all these verses. But I'm just going to sort of rehearse these. We won't turn to all of them. A few of them I'll actually have you turn to so we can look at them together. But listen to what Peter has to say about what Christ has done. Chapter 1, verse 2, we were chosen to be sprinkled with his blood. Verse 3, he caused us to be born again through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Verse 23 of chapter 1, we are born again through the living and enduring word of God. Verse 19 of chapter 1, we are redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Verse 21, through him we are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Chapter 3, verse 18, Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus was our substitute. He died the death we deserved. He took on him the penalty for our sins that we would be brought to God. If you're suffering, we must remember the gospel. Our greatest need has been met. It has been taken care of. Our sin has been dealt with if we are in Christ. The second grace reality that we must embrace to stand firm in suffering is the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Therefore, look ahead to future grace. Peter writes a lot in his book about what is to come, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the appearing of Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you can't read this book end to end and actually miss that. Chapter 1, verse 4, if we are in Christ, we will obtain an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and unfading. It can never be taken from us. It will never lose its luster. Chapter 1, verse 5, we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. We've already experienced salvation, and in that we rejoice. But Peter talks about a salvation that still awaits us. The full extent of our salvation still is future. What lies before is far better than what we experience today, even in Christ. We have something to look forward to. What do we look forward to? Chapter 1, verse 7, we look forward to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 9 of chapter 1, we will receive the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. And if we're in Christ today, again, we're already saved, but the experience of the full salvation of our souls in an imperishable inheritance with Christ still awaits us. Verse 13 of chapter 1, Peter says that we are to fix our hope completely on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't deserve God's grace. We experience grace every single day as he continues to forgive our, forgive our sin. And he blesses us beyond what we deserve. And it won't stop when we die. What will Christ do when he returns? He will show more grace upon us. Long for that day. Future grace is coming. And Christ's 
grace was not exhausted at the cross. Chapter 2, verse 12, when the day of visitation comes on the world, we will escape judgment, that is grace. Chapter 5, verse 1, Peter says, we will be partakers of future glory with Christ. That is grace. We get a share in Christ's glory. We who hated him, Peter who denied him, that is grace. And it's still to come. We can experience that grace in the present life, but it's coming. Death in this life won't take it away. And unless we're still alive, it is coming. Death is how we get there. Chapter 5, verse 6, God, Peter says, God will exalt the humble at the proper time when he returns. This future exaltation for the believer. Chapter 5, verse 10, we see that Christians have been called to eternal glory in Christ. Present ridicule, present slander, present maligning, present sufferings, but eternal glory. Christian, do you want to stand firm in suffering? Don't love this world. But look ahead to the future outpouring of grace when Christ returns. So don't cling to this world. Don't look back with longing on your past life. Chapter 1, verse 14, Peter says, Don't be conformed to the former lusts which are yours in your ignorance. Chapter 1, verse 18, Don't look back with longing at your futile conduct that was inherited from your forefathers. Chapter 4, verse 2, No longer live the rest of the time in the flesh for the lusts of men. Verse 3 of chapter 4, The time already passed is sufficient for you to have worked out the desire of the Gentiles. Look ahead, don't look back. Future grace is better than the present grace, and it's better than our past. The best is yet to come. The third grace reality that you must embrace to stand firm in suffering is that God is near. God is near. He sees, he knows, he hears. Chapter 1, verse 3, Peter writes about the mercy of God. In verse 16 of chapter 1, God is holy. He judges impartially, verse 17. God knows how to judge sin. Chapter 2, verse 3, God is kind. If you have tasted of the kindness of God, Peter says, Doing good and enduring finds favor with God. God actually shows us his favor through suffering. It's because he's good. God judges righteously, 2.23. In a really just remarkable section, which we don't have time to dive into in chapter 3, we see in chapter 3, verse 4, he sees and he values the lowly and quiet spirit. He, it is precious to him. He sees the meek. This is the instruction to wives. In chapter 3, verse 12, God sees the righteous, he hears their prayer, and he knows how to judge evil. In 3.12, Peter quotes Psalm 34. Peter writes, quoting from Psalm 34, "'For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous.'" and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When you're suffering, God knows. He, he hears you when you pray. He sees you. He may not remove you from your suffering because he's aiming at something bigger than your present situation, but he knows, and he cares, and he knows how to deal with those who afflict you. He's trustworthy. Chapter 3, verse 13 Peter writes that we are not to fear earthly fear, not to fear what the Gentiles fear. We don't even need to fear death because nobody can touch us unless God wills it. And if God does will our suffering, even our, in, even our death, verse 17 of chapter 3 says, it is better. Better than our plans, our way, our wisdoms, our idea of good. He is good and he knows what is good for us. Chapter 4, verse 5, God will judge sin, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And 
You can entrust yourself to the Lord and his perfect timing for that. Verse 19, chapter 4, Peter says, Entrust your soul to a faithful creator in doing good. God created the world and is therefore sovereign over it. So we entrust ourselves to a good God who is also the sovereign God. Chapter 5, verse 7, the, the familiar plea, casting all of your anxiety, all of your fears, all of your worries on him. Why? Because he cares for you, believer. So God is near. If we're in suffering, we need to remember that God is near. He hears, he knows, he understands. And we can cast ourselves into his care. The next grace reality that we must embrace to stand firm in suffering is that God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. And so, we are to cultivate trust in God by doing the next right thing. We just read chapter 4, verse 19. And trust your soul to a faithful creator. Notice how God defines the means of our expressing trust in God in this verse. Doing good. Doing good for these believers might be costly. And for that reason, doing the next right thing, that next act of obedience that the Lord has commanded, which may cost us everything, is an appropriate means of faith, expressing faith in God, trust in Him, expressing our trust that the Lord knows what is best and that He is good and sovereign. And in the book of 1 Peter, Peter gives a lot of commands. In a book about suffering, he commands believers over and over again. But consider these commands in that context of suffering. Obedience when it is difficult and costly is a sweet demonstration of submission to the Lord and trust in the Lord. And so as you read these commands and the standard seems high, consider them opportunities to express your trust in the Lord. A a trust that looks just like Peter's expression in chapter 1, verse 8. Though we have not seen you, God, we love you. And though we do not see you now, we believe in you and we rejoice. Kind of taking that third person pronouns on there. Or first person. Help me to obey you, Lord, today when it is difficult and potentially costly because you have commanded it and I trust you. Here's just a sampling of Peter's commands in 1 Peter. In 1.15, he says, Pursue holiness, be holy in all your conduct. 2.2, he says, Long for God's word. We are to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. 2.11, keep your conduct excellent among unbelievers. 2.12 and 3.2, keep a good conscience. Verse 16 of chapter 3. And in chapter 3, we see the implicit command to entrust ourselves to God's design of authority. We are to practice humility even when we're sinned against. We see that in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 5. Don't return evil for evil, chapter 3, verse 9. Give a blessing to those who sin against you. That's difficult. In 2, 1 and 3, 8, we're called to love one another. Chapter 4, verse 8, let your love cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable with one another. Serve one another. Are you suffering? Are you finding it hard to trust the Lord in suffering? Ask yourself, am I actually going hard at obedience to the Lord? Or have I actually allowed my suffering to cause me to turn inward, focus on myself, focus on my circumstances, No, when we're suffering, we need to look outside of ourselves. Uh, Begin to cultivate a greater trust in the Lord by forsaking what may be safest in the world's eyes. and Following what God has, a good God has commanded us to do. And as you walk in that next step of obedience that seems like it's difficult and costly, but it's what the Lord has 
said and command you to do, command you to do watch your trust in the Lord grow. Your boldness and confidence in the Lord grow. Your awareness of his care and provision for you in ways that you didn't even see before. And your desire to stand firm no matter what God ordains for you because he is trustworthy. The fifth grace reality that we must embrace to stand firm in the face of suffering is that grace transforms. Grace transforms. So therefore, in our suffering, we should embrace God's gracious provisions. In the opening of his letter, in verse 2 of chapter 1, Peter writes, To those who reside as exiles, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to the obedience of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of his blood. If you're in Christ, God chose you. And if he chose you, he has set you apart. And if he has set you apart, he set you apart with a purpose. One of those purposes is obedience, conformity to Christ. But he doesn't just command obedience. He actually equips us for this obedience. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Look at verse, chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. If we're in Christ, God has caused our new birth. We have new capabilities. We have new desires to do what we couldn't do before when we were dead in our sin. Look down to verse 22 of chapter 1. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a love of the brothers without hypocrisy, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. Peter calls these believers to love one another because of the fact that their souls have already been washed when they obeyed the truth, when they believed the, the grounding of their ability to respond to the truth was what God caused them to be born again with. That is, through his word. How can we stand firm? How can we hope to stand firm in suffering? By remembering that God is the one who actually started the work in us and giving us new birth. And he has now actually enabled us to walk in obedience to him. He's given us his word. He's given us new birth. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Chapter 4, verse 14, we see the, what God has provided us in the Spirit. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory in God rests on you. We have the Holy Spirit with us in a unique way when we are suffering for the name of Christ. And through the Spirit, God uses the same means which he used to cause our new birth cause us to continue to grow in that new life. God's word. Turn to chapter 2, 1 Peter 2. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of God's word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. God has actually given us what we need to grow. Peter says, cultivate a desire for God's word. You can't grow without it, but in God's grace, a childlike, dependent desire for it, a steady intake of it in the hands of the Holy Spirit in your life will produce further growth in the believer. But notice Peter doesn't just say, read it. He says, long for it. Cultivate a desire for it, like that of a newborn child. Have you ever seen a hungry newborn? What do they want? They cry when they don't get it. They're singularly focused on it. And when a baby is hungry, everybody knows what they want. They refuse to be satisfied by anything else that you try to stick in their mouth instead. Instead. 
Do you long for God's word in this way? Peter says, long for it. Let it be your singular pursuit. Do we want to stand firm in suffering of all kinds? Desire God's word. Drink deeply of it. But we should also be aware of what will actually destroy our appetite for God's word. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 are connected. Verse 2 says, long for the pure milk of God's word in verse 2. It's directly connected to what came before in verse 1. Laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. Believer, if you harbor bitterness towards others, go on speaking against others, envying what others have, and you don't think it won't affect your desire for God's word, your spiritual growth, you're mistaken. A critical component to cultivate an increasing desire for God's word is actually putting off sin. When we endure suffering, when our circumstances seem just stacked against us, there is going to be a temptation to envy what others have, envy the circumstances of others who aren't experiencing what we're experiencing. We might be tempted to turn inward, to isolate, to begin to be suspicious of others, to speak against them, even wish them harm. Why me? Why am I experiencing this? Peter says, lay that aside. Long for God's word, which is able to transform you. When we suffer, there's also a temptation to be consumed by the concerns of the day. And this is true for any type of suffering. We might be concerned and preoccupied with those material things that we need so desperately, a home, food, a job, medical treatment. But what those things cannot do is produce spiritual growth apart from God's word. Cling to God's transforming grace. Cling to and long for his means of grace, his word. God's gracious provision applied by the Holy Spirit to actually cause you to grow in the middle of suffering. Last grace reality I'd like to look at this evening that you must embrace to stand firm in suffering and we would have missed the book of 1 Peter if we didn't get to this one is Christ humbled himself and suffered without sin. So fix your eyes upon his faithful example. Beginning in chapter 2 verse 13, Peter addresses a critical area where his readers are going to need to battle against their fleshly lusts. Where is that? When we find ourselves under authority? Look at chapter 2, verse 13. This is worth turning there for. It always, but chapter 2, verse 13, be subject for the sake of the Lord to every human institution whether it to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him. Skip down to verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters. In our public lives, God has ordained authority structures. We are under the authority of the government, our employers. And under such authority, we are to be defined by willingly subjecting ourselves under that authority not for the sake of those authorities over us, but for the sake of Christ, as slaves of God, Peter says. Look at verse 17. Peter commands us, honor all people, love the brethren, fear God, honor the king. Perhaps somebody might have thought that the king was exempted the first time he said, honor all people. What if our leaders are ungodly? Verse 17 says, even foolish men, ignorant men. Verse 18 says, even crooked men. Again, he ends that list with honor the king. You mean Nero? A murderous, evil, immoral emperor, Peter says, honor him. Honor even the king, the governor, the master, the employer, the supervisor whose foolishness, whose immorality leads you to unrighteous suffering. Look at Verse 19 of chapter 2, for this finds grace or favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unrighteously. 
And in verse 21, again, we get to arguably the pinnacle of the whole book. Without these next verses, the calling to bear up under suffering would seem impossible, but someone has gone before us in suffering. Look at verse 21. For to this you have been called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, who being reviled was not reviling in return. While suffering, he was uttering no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. Believer, we've been given an example of one who suffered without sin. Jesus knew what it was to to suffer, to be slandered, to be accused by others to be hated, ridiculed, belittled, beaten, spit on, insulted, flogged, humiliated, even murdered. Maybe you have an employer that's making your life difficult because of your convictions, or a law that doesn't seem to treat you fairly. It encroaches on what you understand to be your freedom. It's so easy to be tempted to speak out in anger against such behavior that affects us so personally. Do we threaten legal action? Do we want to defend ourselves? We may want to punish the wrong that's done to us. Our fleshly lust may wage inside of us. We desire to be recognized, appreciated, respected. Maybe we desire retribution. Jesus faced these temptations yet never gave in. Verse 23, he was reviled, insulted, threatened, and suffered, and he didn't revile or threaten in response. He didn't take judgment into his own hands, but verse 23 says, kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. God knows how to deal with sin and punish sin. Leave that to the Lord. And in his earthly life, so did Jesus. Point three on our outline was, entrust yourself to a good God. And we might add, entrust yourself to a righteous judge, just like Jesus did. Jesus is our example of how to endure unrighteous suffering. What about chapter 3? Chapter 3 speaks to, first, to wives being subject to their own husbands. Uh, Verse 2 considers the circumstances of a wife's need to be subject to the authority of her husband. When? When he is disobedient to the word, disobedient to God. Well, how do you honor a man that is disobedient to Christ? By fearing God, by adorning yourself with an otherworldly behavior that is precious in the sight of God, even when being mistreated, reviled, or slandered by an unbelieving, disobedient husband who is, and that's difficult, but who is the example, the ultimate example? Well, in the text for Sarah, but ultimately it is Christ. Wives, if this is to be your attitude with even an unbelieving husband, how much more when a believing husband sins against you? Look to Christ. Look to Christ as your example. Let love cover a multitude of sins, chapter 4, verse 8. Sometimes sin must be addressed, but do it in a way that still shows honor and gentleness. Well, in verse 7 of chapter 3, this same humility is required of husbands as well. Husbands, you must honor your wives, live with them in an understanding way. And this, men, this applies for both unbelieving and believing spouses. Yes, at all times, but in this context, especially when you're sinned against. That's what Peter's been talking about the whole book. How do we bear up when we're sinned against? Do we get angry, demand respect, defend ourselves, defend our motives, respond by pointing out all of their sin? I'll be understanding, but not if they're sinning against me. Like me, you felt that. Who is our example? Who do we look to when we're sinned against? Both men and women. Look at verse 8 which is really a summary statement on marriage for both husbands and wives, but also what came before servants and those under the authority of government leaders, all of us. Chapter 3, verse 8, Now to sum up, all of you, be like-minded, sympathetic, brotherly, tender-hearted, and humble in spirit. 
not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but giving a blessing instead. Notice that same language, not returning evil for evil, reviling for reviling. That was the example of Christ in 2.23, who being reviled was not reviling in return. Christ's humility was the example for marriage, was the example for how we bear up under the treatment from our employers. In every command in 1 Peter that seems difficult, impossible even, look to Christ. Well, in the closing chapter of his epistle, Peter, still talking about humility in the church, holds high humility for a couple other groups of people. Chapter 5, verse 5, And all of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Who is the example of humility? Christ, in his earthly life and in his suffering. And Christ is also the forerunner in exaltation, as he was demonstrated to be victorious over sin, death, even demonic powers at his resurrection in chapter 3, and then exalted to the right hand of God in chapter 3, verse 22. So believers, too, have a firm hope of sharing in Christ's glory at his return. And then we will be exalted. But now we follow Christ's example of humility. And in addition to these general instructions on humility in chapter 5, Peter calls out two groups for whom humility is especially essential in chapter 5, elders and young men. And I just want to draw out the unique way that elders are to follow the example of Christ. Notice when speaking to elders in chapter 5, verse 2, he tells the elders to shepherd the flock of God among you. So elders are shepherds or pastors. They are to be among the sheep. Shepherds aren't too good to be among the sheep. They don't stand far off. That would be a proud shepherd, but a humble shepherd is identified as being among the sheep. Remember Jesus giving this instruction to Peter, Peter, if you love me, shepherd my sheep. Now Peter instructs these elders to shepherd the sheep, not their sheep, not Peter's sheep, but Christ's sheep. Keep reading in verse 2. Overseeing, not under compulsion, but willingly according to God. The elders were overseers. In verse 3, they're told not to lord it over the flock, but to be examples to the flock. So elders here are called to the task of shepherd and overseer. And these words aren't accidental. Look back to chapter 2, verse 25. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see those same terms, shepherd and overseer. Elders, too, are called to follow the example of Christ in their humility, in their shepherd, shepherding, in their overseeing. And as they follow Christ's example, they too are to be examples to the rest of the flock. Elders are to be examples of humility at all times. That's true. But elders must first and foremost be examples of humility while suffering unjustly. Elders, how do you respond when slandered, when insulted, when sinned against? What example will you set when persecution comes? Will you be an example to the flock of what it means to suffer at the hands of others? When suffering for the name of Christ, when the pastors and elders are the first in prison for their fidelity to Christ, will you revile when reviled? Oh, let us endeavor to follow Christ's example. Chapter 5, verse 4, this promise for those elders who follow the example of Christ. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfound unfading crown of glory. Believers, if ever there is a book to become acquainted with as we inch towards greater and greater hostility towards believers, 1 Peter is it. Peter knew what it was like to cave under pressure, under persecution. He knows that temptation will come to us in that moment. And he stands before us as a transformed man, pointing us, not to his example, but to the example of Christ. So he exhorts us in chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, 
prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in the faith. To stand firm in the grace of God in suffering, we must, number one, rejoice in the finished work of Christ. Number two, look ahead to future grace. Number three, entrust yourself to the care of a good God. Number four, cultivate trust in God by doing the next right thing when it is difficult and costly because we trust him. Number five, embrace God's gracious provisions. And number six, fix your eyes upon Jesus' faithful example. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that the, the one to whom the, the prophets longed for and looked to, trying to discern, has come. And he has come and he has taken care of our sin, those who are in your son. Lord, thank you for the example of your son who shows us what it's like to be able to endure suffering. And Lord, we can't follow his example. We're going to fail. We're going to stumble. And yet, you know that. And you forgive. And you've given us your word and you've given us your spirit. Lord, may these words just be encouraging to us. May they equip us not only to stand firm in our faith for future suffering when persecution comes, but even in the trials that we face on a daily basis, even in our homes when maybe somebody has sinned against us, how do we respond? Help us to look at your son, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.